So um, actually, I think I think we might just get started, and as No Violet comes in, we'll we'll pull her in. But we only have forty five minutes together, so I want to make the best use of this time. Um, so I'm Errol Anderson. I am the executive director of Caris Circle, which is the nonprofit programming arm of Caris Books and More. Caris Books is the South's oldest independent feminist bookstore. We're located in Decatur, Georgia, and we're longtime members of SEBA, which is one of the um, regional organizations helping to put on this conference. I'm very honored to be with all of you today to celebrate this panel. Um, and I first want to thank all of our sponsors um, who have really helped make this event possible. Um, so those sponsors include HarperCollins, Blackstone, Sourcebooks, Scholastic, Simon & Schuster, Penguin Random House, and Ingram. I'm delighted to present today's international authors panel featuring No Violet, Bulawayo, Bernard Schlink, JJ Bola, and Ahmad Jude. Um, so because we don't have a lot of time together, we're not going to be taking questions from the audience, but we do love to hear from you in the chat. So please show your love for these authors and let us know where you're watching from. Um, no, Violet, I know that you just hopped on the, on the chat and you, you may need a moment to settle, uh, but I, I do, I'm going to begin by introducing you if that's all right. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Hi, okay. Everyone. So welcome we're, we're thrilled we're it's this is a miracle of technology that we are gathered from points all around the globe uh to discuss these wonderful books um so the fact that this is working still feels like a minor miracle to me so um no violet uh Bulawayo is the author of we need new names which was a finalist for the man booker prize and won the penn hemingway award and the la times book prize for first fiction as well as the new zora neale hurston richard wright legacy award she grew up in Zimbabwe and now lives in California. And the book we are here celebrating today is Glory. We are also joined by Bernard Schling. Bernard was born in Germany in 1944. He's a professor emeritus of law at Humboldt University, Berlin, and Cardozo Law School in New York. He is the author of the internationally best-selling novels, The Reader, which became a multi-million copy international bestseller and an Oscar-winning film starring Kate Winslet and Ralph Fiennes and The Woman on the Stairs. Other notable works available in English include Homecoming, Summer Lies, The Weekend, Guilt About the Past, Flights of Love, and the Gerard Self series. He lives in Berlin and New York, and the book we are celebrating today is Olga. JJ Bola is a writer, poet, and UNHCR ambassador. He is the author of three poetry collections, Elevate, Daughter of the Sun, and Word, which were later all published in one definitive collection called Refuge, a novel, No Place Like Home, and Mask Off, Masculinity Redefined, which explores masculinity as a socially conditioned performance. He was one of Spread the Word's Flight, Flight Associates in 2017, and a Kit Duwal scholar for the Burbank University MA in creative writing. As a former refugee, JJ Bola was invited to the Davos Economic Forum in 2018 and held a discussion with Kate Blanchett. JJ reads, speaks, gives workshops, and performs around the world. He currently resides in London, England, and the book we are celebrating today is The Selfless Act of Breathing. Ahmad Jude is a dancer and choreographer who was born in Syria in 1990 and grew up as a stateless refugee in the Al Yarmouk camp on the outskirts of Damascus. Amid the violence of the Syrian civil war, he pursued his dream as a dancer and appeared on the Middle Eastern version of So You Think You Can Dance before mm -hmm. moving to Europe in 2016 to dance with the Dutch National Ballet. He lives in Amsterdam and performs throughout the world. The book we are celebrating today is Dance or Die, From Stateless Refugee to International Ballet Star. It is a memoir. So uh, welcome to you all. Thank you for being here. Uh, we're going to, I'm going to begin with uh, No Violet and, and ask you a couple questions. And then we'll go to Bernard, then to JJ, and then um, close out with Ahmad. And then we'll do a quick lightning round. So the goal is to let everybody know about these wonderful books as much as possible. So, no, Violet, um, I, I loved Glory, and um, I, I want folks to know a little bit about it and um, that it is an allegorical book containing lots of humor, but also lots of insightful critique. Um, and it is sort of a, a, a novel about a fictional nation. There are many parallels between Old Horse and 
the former president of your home country of Zimbabwe, um, Robert Mugabe. Um, and many may draw parallels between Orwell's Animal Farm. So I'm wondering if you could say a bit about what allegory and humor can do that a more realist mode may not allow, um, particularly when it comes to political critique. Uh, firstly, thank you for having me and greetings to everybody. Uh, thank you for making the time to join us. So, um, this is the first time I'm actually, or oh, second time I'm talking about glory. So, and I just, I'm just coming from a heavy rounds of revisions. So it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's such a pleasure to be able to finally share the book with, uh, with readers. So humor um, is very important to me, especially for somebody who is almost always drawn to, to, to heavy subjects. It makes, I feel like it makes my, uh, my material uh, accessible and open. And uh, allegory on the other hand, kind of solved the dilemma of how to write a story that was also inspired by events that were still happening, still unfolding. Um, and often felt like they were competing with my fiction because they were so bizarre and unbelievable. Um, so working with, uh, with animals was a, an opportunity for me to bring freshness, to bring uh, interesting insights, to play with the familiar and kind of try and render, uh, render it strange. And at the same time, also channeling what to me was uh, very formative. That is the, the oral stories uh, of my grandmother that sort of were the, you know, the, 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 the back backdrop of my, of my childhood. So pulling all those threads together and, of course, thinking about George Orwell's Animal Farm, which is a book that generations uh, of Zimbabwean students had to read, you know, for our English literature and thinking about how back in, you know, uh, a few decades back, Orwell used the, 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 used the technology of, 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 of satire allegory to tell a political tale um, that still resonated and that was still connected to what I was doing a few decades later. Um, you know, it, it, it really just making those, those, those choices and coming back to the idea of making work fresh, even, even as it wasn't. Um, it's, I, I think I'll also mention that the story was uh, playing out on Twitter, on social media, for those of you who were plugged in on what, on what was happening on my end of the world. So trying to juggle all those things and trying to write a story that will still sound interesting to people who were see, seeing it unfold in real time inspired some of my choices. I think your, your comment that writing fiction is more difficult in our contemporary moment because reality is so strange and unbelievable, I think is a very universal feeling, regardless of where in the world people live. Um, I, I know so many authors have, have echoed that sentiment. So I think that choice um, to go with allegory is really powerful and it is very effective. Um, so in Tongues of Power, which is an early, so folks should know these chapters are very short. They're very, they're very quick and they're very fun, um, even as they're dealing with very, you know, consequential and heavy subjects. Um, in Tongues of Power, you write about the difference between old horses language, uh, which is this mm -hmm. colonial uh, English mouth, so the, the animal, English um, and his, you know, the way in which colonial English has has colonized his tongue and how it's a marker of his, you know, narcissistic sense of his own excellency versus um, Dr. Sweetmother who resists him by speaking her own language and her own tongue. Can you say a little bit about how language works for you as a Zimbabwean writer? Um, who works in two linguistic modes? And, you know, how do you think about what gives your tongue the most power as you're writing? Um, I inherited English, of course, after the violence of colonialism. My generation, you know, we came up uh, as the first generation after independence. I was born just a, 
a year before, uh, no, a year after Zimbabwean uh, independence from British colonial rule. So English really hovered over our lives as the language of, of business, as the official language, and it's still the official, official language. But for me, there was a disconnect because it's not, it wasn't the language of intimacy. And by that, I mean, it's not the, it wasn't the language that I was speaking at home. I only encountered it in school and left it there. And of course, we were independent. So it didn't quite have the weight for me that it had for the generation of my father, who was also the generation of the former president of Zimbabwe, uh, Robert Mugabe. As an artist, of course, it makes for an interesting uh, challenge, writing in a language that is that doesn't feel quite intimate in a way that makes it, if, that, if this makes sense, in a way that, that masks the struggle that, um, that I go through when I am trying to figure out myself on the page and mm -hmm. thinking of English as this wall, as this door that I'm always having to negotiate. That said, you know, pairing it with my, it has taught me uh, to, to think about pairing it with my own language and what I am always trying to do and what I hope my work is consist consistently pushing for is to marry English with my language, uh, which has its own rhythms, which for me has a fluidity and an intimacy that I don't always get with English. But having said that, I mean, writers from all over the world have been changing how we think about language. Immigrant writers have been changing how we think about language. So it's really not a dilemma. It ends up being a joy. Uh, it ends up being an advantage. Thank you so much. So there's so much to say, so much more to say about this book, but in the interest of time, I would encourage all of our readers to please just go get a copy of Glory from the Galley Room, read it yourself, um, and, and be prepared to uh, sell it to your folks this holiday season. It is a wonderful book and will make a wonderful gift. Um, thank you for your comments. Um, now I'd like to move on to Bernard. Um, in some ways, Bernard, uh, in very different ways from Glory, Olga is also a political novel. Um, I'm of the camp, though, that probably all fiction is political. But um, can you share a bit about how the microcosm of focusing on Olga uh, helped you tell a larger geopolitical story? Well, thank you for having me, first of all. Olga is an orphan who grows up poor and unloved in a small village in Prussia in the 1880s. And she falls in love with Herbert, a minor aristocrat mm -hmm. who later wants to marry her, but there is a class divide and his family's snobbish resistance. And also Olga by then has managed to gain some independence as an elementary school teacher. And she didn't want to lose this independence. So she refuses his marriage proposal. It's a story about this class divide and also the gender inequality of the late 19th and early centuries, the early 20th century from the outset. And then Herbert, who becomes a soldier and fights a colonial war against the Hereros in what's now Namibia, and does it with enthusiasm, uh, he's part of the aristocratic military industrial complex of those times that led to World War I. He doesn't go to World War I because he goes on this expedition into Arctica in Namibia, he fell in love with the endless expanse of the desert and then goes to Antarctica to find the endless white desert like no other on an ill-prepared uh, expedition where he dies. But he's very much a child of this world of this world of warriors, of soldiers, of explorers, who uh, is seen by Olga 
very clearly, clearly in uh, the emptiness of his dreams of grandeur, the futility of his explorations, the sense of nihilism he shares with a generation of young men who rush to war and rush to death. So their love story is intertwined with the conflicts of uh, their times. And uh, later when she has to flee and has to build a new model's life as a seamstress in uh, West Germany, of course, making sense of such a life means making sense of the history in which it happened. So the novel is comprised of three parts, which are separated stylistically and by point of view. Um, what did these sections allow you to do that you, you feel you could not have done, um, or maybe, I, I assume, you feel you could not have accomplished had you chosen just one mode? Well, I wanted the reader to become closer to Olga from one part of the novel to the next. First, uh, he reads Olga's story as if told by an omniscient distant narrator. Finally, we learn, or at the beginning of part two, we learn that he is Ferdinand, the child in the family into which she comes every couple of weeks to sow and to mend. And he becomes, there grows a bond between them. And this friendship lasts until her death. So part two is his encounter with her, the friendship that grows between them. And he keeps trying to find out more about her and more about her life. And he finally finds the letters that she writes to Herbert that are supposed to be read by him after his return. And he finds these letters and he finds out that she even kept writing Ferdinand Herbert letters after she knew that he would never come back. So in part three, the reader, uh, he is her own voice in, in these letters. So step by step, the reader gets closer to her and step by step, I got closer to her writing the novel. And did you write them chronologically in that way? I wrote it in that way, yeah. It's very, it's very effective. So um, again, I wanna encourage folks to pick up Olga in the galley room. It is, I think, a wonderful holiday gift as well. Um, anyone who loves historical fiction, sort of this, this sweep again of, of historical, but also intimacy, um, you do you do become very connected to Olga, uh, and and I think by the end, uh, many people will will hope that Olga is a real person because she feels so so real. So, um, thank you so much, Bernard. Uh, now we'll move on to JJ Bola. Um, JJ, the language of the book, uh, the novel is is so transporting and beautiful. Um, I was in it from from page thank one. You. And yeah, thank you. Um, so uh, I was not, I, I had not paid attention to the fact that you were a poet before I started reading the novel. And then I found out that you were a poet and I was like, well, of course, of course you're a poet. Um, <laughs> and uh, so I'm wondering if you could just say a bit about, you're also obviously a nonfiction writer and you've written another novel. So you work in multiple modes, but can you say a bit about how your work as a poet affects your work as a novelist? Wow, that's a really good question. Um, I think for me, poetry, the way that I kind of use poetry is more about sensitivity and perception. Like, so I try to use my poetry in a way that allows me to feel, like really feel the story, really kind of like feel the emotions and convey the emotions of, of the protagonists and of the characters and hopefully use language in a way that carries um, those emotions. Now, obviously, like it's a nearly a 300 page book, so you don't want it to be completely poetic the whole way through. That would be exhausting. It'd be exhausting for me to write as well, do you know what I mean? But um, I think that those kind of like heightened moments of expression is where I really try to kind of use poetry to get the reader to connect with, um, with the feeling and, and, and the characters. 
I definitely think that works. And I think in some ways this to me felt like a very impressionistic novel and a very experiential novel, which, you know, ideally all novels are experiential, but some are more experiential. Mm -hmm. than others. And the main character, Michael is dealing with um, sort of a dislocation, disassociation, depression relating to living in a racist white supremacist world, but also, you know, just navigating life, right? Like some of this is, mm -hmm. is due to um, living in colonial countries. Some of this is due to, you know, the individual circumstances of his life as a teacher, of him just navigating the world and also being a person who has, you know, chronic depression, it, it feels like. And um, the ways that you use style to help the reader feel what he's feeling felt really unique to me. And one of those choices, I don't want to give too much away for, for y'all, but one of those choices is the very smart use of both the first and the third person. Um, mm -hmm. and I'm wondering if you could say a bit about how you made that choice and when you made that choice in your writing. Did you always know that you would be using both the first and the third, or was that something that came in later? So it came in much later. Um, actually, my initial idea, and this is where editing and experimentation is important, my initial idea was to write it in second person. <laughs> and I just didn't feel, even for, even for myself as the writer of it, that I was able to really connect um, with, oh gosh, my laptop is playing sounds. How do I get it to start? Oh my gosh, look at that. <laughs> wow. <laughs> what kind of timing is this? You it's know, a whole symphony. Um, okay, so I'm just going to switch it off and hopefully it's they're just... Goodness me, this is taking longer than... Okay, brilliant. Wow, sorry about that. <laughs> it's funny how it waits at the right moment. Um, so yeah, sorry. As I was saying, um, I wanted to use that um, uh, to, to use the kind of tense of the first person and the third person to try to convey two different aspects of Michael. You know, in one aspect, you kind of get the, the general sense of what the world sees. And, you know, on the surface, he's a young man who's a teacher. You know, he's, um, he's got kind of good friendships, developing relationships. And he's doing relatively well. Um, on the surface level but when I go into the first person that's where I wanted the reader to get a little bit closer um, to explore what's going on inside him internally his own internal conflicts and much of that is definitely related to the societal issues that um, are his challenges but I think also there's a huge part that are just kind of personal to him and his own um, life experiences now obviously mental health um any kind of serious mental health or just mental health generally are exacerbated by certain circumstances and by particular political issues. But I think regardless of that, there are things that we just feel universally as human beings that sometimes don't have a core kind of explanation or root explanation. You know, you can have two people who experience the exact same treatment, but it will profoundly impact one person in one way and the other person perhaps not so much. And so what I wanted to do with Michael as well was just to allow people to go on a journey with him as he is also going on a journey with himself. Yes, and this is literally sort of a travel book in some ways. He, there are many locations in this book. And um, did you, have you been to all of those places or were you sort of like, like was there, were you drawn to those places for particular reasons um, outside of they make sense for the character or yeah so um i've been very lucky to be able to travel um, to many places and what uh, and especially like within america as well and upon traveling to america like my first initial um time to travel there was when i was a teenager and then throughout like uh, years later on and what struck me was how different each state was I just thought America was America, but like there's so many nuances um, as an outsider. You just learn, wow, OK, so it's really like this here or like that here. And and so what I wanted to do um, was just to kind of take the reader on that journey as well and not to give too much away. But there is a bit of a, a kind of like symbolic cyclical element to the journey and the trajectory that he goes on. And he eventually arrives. Um, oh gosh, he eventually arrives somewhere. <laughs> oh, that was close. <laughs> oh, 
That was close. I always do that way. But he goes yeah. on the journey, and there's lots of symbolism there. <laughs> yes. Okay. So before we before we give too much away, go go find JJ's book in the gallery room. Read it for yourself. Um, I think this is especially a good book for um, you know young adults who are uh, you know trying to find themselves reflected in fiction. Um, this is this is a wonderful realist novel, um, and and for folks who really want books that feel like, you know, things are not sugar coated, right? Um, but to me, is a very affirming book in terms of you know helping you see life is life is complicated, um, but it is not necessarily uh, terrible, right? That even though hard things happen, there's also hope and connection in this book which i really valued and again the thank language you. is beautiful so um thank, thank you. you so much jj um and uh last but not least ahmad welcome thank you um so your book dance or die from stateless refugee to international ballet star is the only memoir in this bunch um and so we are celebrating it today um but it shares some of the the universal themes that we've been talking about in these novels of dislocation, yearning, um, hope, you know, all of these things. Um, I am wondering, you know, you've, you've had such a remarkable life in one medium as a ballet star. Um, how did you know it was time to write a memoir? Um, well, first of all, I want to thank you for having me here and for giving me the opportunity to be part of this webinar. You cannot imagine how much it matters to me growing up as a stateless refugee to be able today to present my book to the world. Like it means a lot to me. Um, one day this kind of um, event, let's say, was uh, much more bigger than a dream for me. Uh, that's why I'm wearing this shirt that says a dream uh, in Arabic. Um, I wanted, I thought it's time to write this story after there was a documentary, uh, actually still is a documentary about my life. And after I saw how much this documentary um, like aff affected other people and uh, how much inspired uh, other people and helped them to realize how lucky they are in their life, I wanted my story to reach more people. And I wanted it to be there forever uh, because this story has a value and it's not only about the person, it's about, it's about the statement. It's about so many people who end up, ended up uh, stateless after certain conflict. And during the Syrian war, for example, we didn't have any voices. We didn't have any rights. And we were, we were like trapped and killed and not even counted. So um, I wanted to give a voice for those people and to give them this, for, this voice through writing a story of a ballet dancer, not writing, uh, let's say, uh, about uh, the war or about uh, yeah, conflicts through, through like soldiers' eyes. I, wanna write it, I wanted to write it through ballet dancers' eyes. And uh, yeah, growing up uh, and... Uh, like going through what I've been through in my life, it taught me a lot about, about life. It taught me so much. And I wanted to share this with people. I wanted people to realize and understand how lucky they are if they are safe and if they are um, protected and if they have a nationality and if they have a home. So that's why I wrote my book, actually. And that that comes through so beautifully because your grandparents are also from Palestine. Um, and mm -hmm. so it's really the story of, of two sort of stateless peoples in, in one. Um, and I think uh, particularly in the United States, uh, the history of Palestine and the history of Syria uh, are very misunderstood. And so I think what's lovely about your book is that people can go on this very um, entertaining and diverting journey with you while also learning a lot of important history um, that is often intentionally mistold in the United States um, and frankly lied about. And so um, I think this is a real gift to 
readers in the United States who have not always been told the truth about um, the, the history of Palestine or of Syria and Syrian people. So, um, and why, and why um, people like you and your family have been stateless, right? And the U.S.'s role in that. Um, so I was wondering, you're somebody who obviously as a dancer possesses an immense amount of discipline and commitment to your craft. I'm wondering what um, your relationship, what did you learn about craft by writing that you maybe had not known um, from practicing dance? Um, I, I, I am a dancer because I say what I want to say, what I cannot say by words, I say by my body and my movement. Like, mm -hmm. as I wrote in my book, I sweat my tears. And uh, yeah, um, so when I was writing my book, I was writing as if I'm dancing. So I just like used the, the dancing form with words. And uh, I tried to express what I feel while dancing. I tried to express how I felt when I was dancing in places which is under ISIS control, where the sniper was shooting around me. What I felt that could, that could keep me uh, that could keep me dancing, even if he's sh shooting, and the moment he stops shooting. So uh, these kind of moments are just I just expressed um, uh, by writing, and um, yeah, I expressed so many so many things i i wanted to i wanted this book to be a voice for people who has no voice and uh, not only by uh, let's say political um conflict or something it's within our families sometimes we don't have a voice like my first um enemy in my passion was my father now he's my greatest support actually like after after a very long time <laughs> almost more than 11 years but now he he is a supporter um but uh, it's as well for, to the parents like uh, hear your kids it's not only like it's it's a war of existing like i want it to exist first in my family or in my community or in the world so i had to earn my existence in the system of the world I think that's so relatable and universal about young people trying to find their way in the world. And although your experiences, I do think are extraordinary and unique, um, they also are very human. And I think any, any reader who picks this book up is going to feel that connection, particularly to the, the young child, you just trying to mm -hmm. follow your passion with your father. And I think a lot of particularly, you know, young boys who are interested in art that is not traditionally masculine uh, will definitely relate to this and, and feel, feel a kinship with what you went through um, to be able to, to pursue your dance. And I think it's going to give a lot of um, people, a lot of hope and, and connection to see how successful you've been. Um, so thank you so much for sharing your story. And um, again, this book is available in the gallery room. We hope that everyone will pick it up and read it so that you can know about it for the holiday season. Uh, we have just a little bit time left and I wanted to do a little lightning round of quick questions for you all, just some fun questions. Um, because even though all of your books are um, on important you know, serious topics, they also have moments of levity. So one of the things I always like to know is um, what, what book is your book or what books, if you prefer, is your book most in conversation with? Um, or you could say, what book is your book dancing with? Um, and uh, we can start with No Violet, if you're okay to begin. Um, Animal Farm, obviously, but also dictator novels like uh, Wizard of the Crow by Ngugi Wationgo, uh, Feast of the Court by uh, Mario Vargas Llosa, um, Waiting for the Wild Beasts to Vote by Ahmad Koruma. Yeah, just three examples there are more. Wonderful, thank you. Bernard, what about you? What is Olga in conversation with? Well, I think it's conversation with Effie Breezed by Theodor Fontana. And I think also it's in conversation with Alice Monroe's stories about young women 
who grow up under difficult poor conditions and then try to find their way into the world and in the world and become something. And uh, that's in a way Olga's generation who women who were forced to live lives in which their needs and dreams had to take a backseat to those of the men in their lives and who had to live under their possibilities, often surrounded by men who lived above theirs. And that's Olga and that's Effie Priest and that are many of the young girls in Alice Monroe's stories. Yes, for sure. Uh, I love that line, men who lived above theirs, right? Um, that's still true today, unfortunately. Um, JJ, what about you? Um, I would say Albert Camus' The Stranger um, is definitely sitting at the table as well. And I would um, add uh, a man called Ove, um, Transcendent Kingdom, and maybe Season of Migration to the North by Taif Saleh as well, which, um, yeah, they're all kind of like quite uh, books about personal experience, about journeying and have a lot of like existential elements to it as well. Wonderful, thank you. What about you, Aman? I think my book is Dancing with Billy Elliot. <laughs> I think <laughs> I think we kind of have the same story. Yeah. I love that. I can see that absolutely. Um, mm -hmm. So we often uh, love to know if you know if your work is interdisciplinary. Um, so some, some writers love to write with music on in the background. Some writers like to be in crowded cafes. Some writers demand silence. Um, but so there's literally, do you, do you write, does your, does your practice involve sound, but also metaphorically, if your book had a soundtrack, um, what would be the first track on the, on the soundtrack album? And we'll go in the same order. Um, I'd say All Right by Kendrick Lamar, which to me feels like an anthem of um, protest, resistance, but also prayer for a better world. And that was that's really what I was trying to write to, writing against tyranny and also dreaming of the world that is possible. Great song. <laughs> What about you, Bernard? Well, Olga loses her hearing. She becomes deaf. That's why she has to become a seamstress. And I think I would have the book begin with the noise of the sewing machine. And maybe after a moment, Olga teaches herself the piano and the organ, and she loves Bach, maybe one of the French sweets slowly growing into this noise of the sewing machine. I love that. JJ? Um, I would say that, um, so I generally, when I write, I, I write, I almost always write with music. I need to kind of find some ways to unplug from the sounds of the real world. And I use like whatever song to try and help me get into the zone. Um, and for this book, I would say maybe two tracks I would suggest. First is uh, Solange uh, Knowles' Cranes in the Sky. Um, and the other one would be, so there's a UK artist called Ben Howard. He's kind of like an indie alternative guitarist singer. And he has a song called Depth Over Distance. And I wrote so much of the book with those two songs on repeat. That I'm surprised, like I didn't sneak in lyrics in there somehow. <laughs> so yeah, those two songs. Nice. Come on. Yeah, I think. Um, well, there is a very huge connection between my book and music because, as well, I wrote it listening to music. The music I was listening to is uh, mostly to Azam Ali. She's uh, like Middle Eastern uh, musician and. Yeah, I love her music. It's so much about um, 
passion and connection to the universe. And uh, yeah, that's what I feel when I'm dancing. And of course, the track that could go with my book, I think the music Enigma, if you know it. Uh, there is some moments where I wrote uh, when I was a kid, I used to dance on this music and I wrote about those moments in the book. It would be nice to listen to it while you're reading this chapter to take you there. Great. Um, and then finally, uh, if, if your book had a season, like a, a season of the year, um, what would your book season be? I'd say summer. It's not uh, a happy book, but I think the end certainly checks, you know, certainly is a good, is a good fit for summer. It's new beginnings, new hopes, and joy. What about you, Bernard? Well, in a way, it's a fall book. <laughs> but uh, there's so much hope and strength in Olga that I would decide against fall and would opt for spring. JJ? Um, I, would, I would definitely say autumn, or what you guys call fall. Um, it's cozy, it's comfortable, hot chocolate, etc. But sometimes you do get caught in, in the rain and in the cold and so forth. But uh, you do come out the other side always kind of um, with a bit of sunshine here and there. So, yeah. And fall's my favourite season as well. So, <laughs> yeah. Yes, I would say the winter. There is some uh, chapters where I wrote about dancing under the rain uh, on the beach. So maybe if you read this while it's raining, it would be nice. Wonderful. Um, I'm glad that actually all my 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 chosen season for all of your books is in alignment with your your season. So I'm, <laughs> I'm glad that I'm I'm on point. Uh, although Bernard, I will say I was more fall for you than spring, but um, <laughs> that's that's just the the cozy feeling I got with Olga. Um, well, thank you all so much. This has been really lovely and fun. Um, I know we could we could spend all day together, but. Our goal is really just to, to offer just a little bit of a teaser so that um, our, our fellow booksellers will get excited. They will go to the gallery room, they will pick up your books, they will read them, and then they will know how to talk about them for um, all of their customers and, and really be good advertisements for your books so that we can get these out um, into the world as much as possible to a US audience. So um, we would really love um, for everyone in the chat, if you can, if you can clap digitally, uh, we are we are very grateful to all four of you for joining us from around the world today. Um, I want to encourage folks to stay online with us in this room because immediately following this session is Around the World in Children's Writing with G. Z. Schmidt, the author of Dream. We Dreamweavers will share some international trends in children's writing. So we have done our adult panel. If you want to hang on for just a few minutes, we will get to our children's panel. Um, and, uh, and again, I hope that you all stay safe and well, and that um, these books do really well for you and that you get to enjoy um, their, their birthing in the world. But thank you for spending time with us. I've really enjoyed it. Thank you.